Welcome everyone. It's great to see so much interest in food for degrowth. My name is Anitra Nelson. I'm affiliated with Melbourne University's Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute hosting this event. And a thanks to the assistance of colleague Claire Denby. Congratulations to Missy because this is the first National Sustainable Living Festival that it has hosted. I'm joined by co-editor of Food for Degrowth, Fern Edwards, who's got up super early to join us from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and by contributor Terry Lay, affiliated with University of Newcastle. We'll talk, each of us, for about seven minutes, leaving 35 minutes for questions, which you can start popping into the Q&A box now. Just the Q&A box, we're not using chat for the questions. I begin by acknowledging the various traditional owners of the numerous lands from which we all participate in this online event. I respectfully acknowledge elders past, present and future of the Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands I live and work, specifically the Jajarawang, also known as the Jara people. This land always was and always will be theirs. A good place to start because Indigenous peoples have practiced degrowth, including food for degrowth, for millennia. In majorly overconsuming countries such as Australia, where the average resident consumes around three or four times what is sustainable for our planet, degrowth means minimizing material and energy use to live modestly. But degrowth also means minimizing inequalities. In Australia, there are people who are homeless or don't get enough nutritious food. So for them, degrowth means having secure shelter and access to food. This collection, Food for Degrowth, Principles and Practices, has just come out in the Routledge Environmental Humanities series. It follows Housing for Degrowth, which came out mid 2018. We hope a range of degrowth topics and themes will follow. We called for contributors um, at international degrowth conferences that often attract a couple of thousand participants and hundreds of papers. Such conferences are key because the movement operates as an open decentralized network rather than with a headquarters. Still, you can see the URL in, to a primary degrowth site in a range of relevant links that we've placed in chat. In terms of activism, degrowth functions around campaigns, such as protesting against all advertising and unnecessary, say car and aeroplane infrastructure, fighting for food sovereignty and indigenous people's control over land and self-provisioning. Yet key to our collection, many activists experiment with changing household practices and create novel and collective forms of organization towards a degrowth future. The more than 30 contributors are activist scholars, most affiliated with universities from doctoral students through to professors. Many chapters are co-authored representing collectives and they use methods known as participatory action research, ethnography and autoethnography. Chapters range from a narrative analysis of how one household has become majorly self-sufficient through self-provisioning in food, including through lots of community-based activities. They include a detailed map of local environmental and social resources in Dalesford and Hepburn, develop a concept of neo-peasantry and discuss dilemmas of living on stolen land. They operate in a largely non-monetary economy with just a few days of paid work a week to support their family. There are chapters on various models on the generic community supported agriculture model in Italy, in Hungary and in Spain. Those chapters show that degrowth CSA models focus on Earth's limits and partially non-monetary forms of production and distribution. There are statistical and qualitative analyses of traditional backyard vegetable and fruit growing and sharing in the Czech Republic and various assessments of ways in which caring economies fail as well as flourish within degrowth collective activities. You'll encounter degrowth terms such as frugal abundance, convivial tools and open relocalization. Chapters include a critique of circular economies 
Another contrasts approaches to waste by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and a degrowth food rescue initiative is a review of the collaborative Budapest Food City Lab initiatives. Yet another chapter reports on regaining Indigenous control of food provisioning. And there's an analysis of ways in which urban women in Nairobi are working against the pressures to turn standard products in supermarkets by cleverly maintaining nutritious food supplies from rural areas and traditional food preparation. Well, I hope that's given you a bit of a flavour of the book. So I'm going to turn you over now to Fern. Thank you, Anitra. Good morning, everyone. Hi from Trondheim in Norway. Um, so what I'm going to do is draw out some of the key points raised in the chapters that speak to critical food studies. The first point's about care. Care is coming up more and more in labour and urban studies literature these days, especially due to works of authors such as Tronto and Fisher, Pig de Palacaza and Williams, the later of which advocates for careful justice in the city. In three chapters by Pungus, Bruckner and Holmes, um, they all speak to they will seek to put care and reproduction at the centre of societal analysis and attention. Economic profit is displaced by care, care for others, care for nature, care for oneself, reciprocal caring about, caregiving and care receiving. Pungus in her chapter on the Dutchess, uh, current or former garden cooperatives in Estonia, examines care for nature care and caring for each other. So for example, grandmothers who want their grandchildren to have only the healthiest and tastiest clean food. Um, she also talks about caring for oneself, where gardening can improve mental and physical health, decreases stress and anxiety, counters feelings of dependence and uselessness, and offers spiritual benefits through uh, a meaningful activity. Pungus offers a great quote from a gardener that captures how degrowth encourages a redirection away from economic values or to purely economic values to consider others, where she says, see the rose is blossoming and I am relaxing. Why should I then calculate the costs? Alternatively, uh, Bruckner focuses on care by researching women's revaluing of traditional consumption of African indigenous leafy vegetables, um, which is sort of superfoods, and more less affectionately known as weeds in Kenya. Women's care for their families and friends through food with a degrowth focus flips the switch from a, a focus um, on economic productivity to instead consider holistic factors such as nutrition, climate resilience, and the co-benefits of crop, insect, people, and place diversity, as well as women's cultural knowledge and labor inequalities. Holmes and colleagues um, investigates care with respect to gender labor in community supported agriculture in Catalonia, where she looks behind um, assumptions to consider who is doing the caring and are they being care, um, adequately cared for in return. They recognize that more research is needed to consider the invisible and unpaid care present in alternative food activities and the uncertain place of family, household and gendered expectations of self and others. So the second point I wanna draw on is sharing. Food sharing is also being widely discussed these days in the sharing cities and collaborative consumption literature, in addition to as a reaction against more precarious and often more isolated societies and with respect to changing technologies that in turn influence how we relate to each other. Sharing in food for degrowth is most apparent in sharing knowledge and skills to improve and scale up and out the movement. The chapter by Sakal and Bolsaks dive into living labs in Budapest to further push ahead potential local, app local applications for degrowth. And here, co-creation, an increasingly popular term, is being used um, to explain the process to help bring people together um, a for just and sustainable food practices to help innovate, brainstorm and develop ideas that can be adapted to suit local conditions and concerns. So that brings me to my third point of degrowth networks or scaling up food for degrowth practices. And co-creation makes another appearance here as a form of sharing ideas across sectors. In the chapter I wrote with Sergio Pedro and Sarah Rocca, we explore multi-level forms of food governance in our two international just and sustainable food projects, 
Um, so complementing their Portuguese speaking international network with my work on Eddy Sitnet, a European project that works in 12 cities across the world to establish an international edible cities network. And we use these two examples to discuss approaches to help people come together to share reflections and opportunities um, in order to overcome barriers that can occur across different sectors, places and backgrounds, all based on degrowth and food as commons principles. And my final point is on the scaling up of food for Diego through technology, discussed in a chapter I wrote with Ricard Espelt on sharing new technologies and community sort of supported agricultures in Barcelona to consider how their politics is shaped by and can shape the tools they use. Applying my close up case study work of a CSA in Barcelona to the amazing extensive mapping work of CSAs done by Ricard we see how technology can be used for good and think about the strategies to make sure it stays that way as more um, community supported agriculture uh, seek to extend and strengthen the ethical degrowth consumption practices. So that's a lot of inspiring and practical examples in the book. Um, I'd like to next hand it over to Terry who will talk about his chapter and his experiences. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm actually going to probably just uh, talk about my chapter at the end of this. I, I think it's um, sort of interesting to look at the book taken as a whole. I found the book very inspiring. I, I particularly like the way that the book goes into really detailed descriptions of various kinds of degrowth food initiatives around the world. And, and there's a great variety of these uh, discussed in the book. Um, what I, what, one of the things, um, so, so some of these chapters are very, um, Kind of optimistic and 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 talk about the, the 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 you know on the lines of we've got this right and this is how we do it and this this is what this is what uh, an alternative food initiative sh should be organised like particularly I'm thinking of, of the one about the CSA the um, community supported agriculture organisation near Venice which runs on a so solidarity cooperative framework. And, and there are other chapters like this too. And, and, and to some extent, I, I, some, sometimes these initiatives aren't all that, uh, you know, old, they're quite recent. Um, and, you know, and so we'll see how these work out, but they're, they're massively interesting and, and, the, and the details terrific. Um, other chapters concentrate on, I, I think, and, and probably it's high time to doing this in the degrowth movement, some of the problems with alternative food initiatives. For example, it's hard to compete on price with the mass production supermarket chains if you're using a, a very small scale and if you're paying the farm workers a, a decent wage. Um, so, so various authors like Stenchcock on Hungary and uh, Sakel and so on talk about these issues. Um, there's also a discussion of the difficulty um, of running an organisation like a CSA or a food cooperative on voluntary labour and, and how that this can interfere with people's care work at home and, and with their necessity to, to, to get an, a job and have an income and so on and how particular, you know, like you have to go and collect your vegetables on Thursday night at eight o'clock and this can actually be impossible for some people. And also um, the, pri the price is sometimes prohibitive for certain sections of the community. Uh, and 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 some of the uh, one chapter, for example, the one by Holmes talks about the peaks and declines in in membership of food alternative organisations, uh, and and points to the fact that that as yet, at any rate, these organ these um, in experiments are a somewhat um, a small part of the total food landscape. For example, three to four percent of land in in Hungary is devoted to agri uh, to organic agriculture. The problems of getting access to land, you know, a lot of a land is monopolized by large companies and these sort of things. Um, so, so, that, so quite a few chapters are about this and I'll come back to that. Another, another thing to, to be pointed out, I think, is that um, a lot of the chapters which don't um, talk about these problems are talking about non purely non-monetary alternatives. Obviously, the problems are located in attempt to making these initiatives work in the context of a market economy. And some of the non-monetary initiatives are totally fascinating. For example, self-provisioning in the Czech Republic and Europe is, is up to, you know, up to 50% of people's intake of food and vegetables is coming from this sort of source. Um, 
the push for African leafy green vegetables, which is totally initi initiated at a local level and doesn't involve any monetary exchange necessarily. Sometimes it does, but more often it doesn't. Um, the, the cooperatives, um, sort of little allotment cooperatives in Estonia that they talk about, these are really interesting discussions. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at this through, through the lens of my, my book that I'm writing at the moment on permaculture, the politics of permaculture. And like in that book, I argue that we, we shouldn't, should not see the market economy with cooperatives as the feasible long-term uh, outcome of degrowth. But what we need to look at the, these kind of um, market alternatives that are being developed now as, as necessary part of a transition to a, a more non-monetary to eventual outcome. If we look at it like this, what we can suggest is that these initiatives may be seen as hybrids that combine some aspects of the marketplace with, with aspects of trying to make a commons economy work and trying to make an ethical and caring economy work. Um, and what we could say coming out of this is a number of, of lessons, if you like. Um, first of all, that um, the first implication is that it's not an easy thing to make um, a, an aspect of the commons economy work in a market economy. And some of the uh, of the chapters in this book explain why what, that, that sort of thing. The second thing is that we have to pay attention if we're involved in, in this sort of initiative with the market aspects as well as the non-market aspects and kind of get both right. So for example, one of the, uh, one of the problems that um, that, that has experienced is a situation where you've got an organisation, it's a food cooperative, and every um, people are expected to volunteer in order to make it more of a, a, a gift economy or a sharing economy. Everyone's expected to volunteer their work to organise the, the, the collective. And sometimes that's a bit difficult to make, it, to make that hap happen or to involve people. So in cases like that, and as, as, that, as that particular chapter says, an alternative is to actually pay someone to do some of that organising sort of you know, like moving it in a more market direction, but 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 not not giving up on the aims of the project in the first place. Um, we also need to to recognise that there are sometimes problems with totally mon non monetary alternatives. That, for example, the problem of getting access to land and equipment unless you have money to pay for it and buy it. Even the quarter acre block that. Patrick Jones and Meg Ullman talk about in, in one of the early chapters is something that they have been able to purchase, you know, on the market. Um, and that members need money for non-food non expenses. So they're, they're forced to work in jobs where, that, where, where it not, doesn't necessarily give them much time or energy to involve themselves in a non-market alternative food cooperative or whatever. And, and so fi finally, I'd probably say that, um, that in, in the long run, we have to look at, um, a non-market a non economy is a way to go to resolve some of these problems. So that's probably a fairly controversial perspective, but anyway, that I'll just end with, I won't end with that. Now I'll just briefly, I think I've got another two minutes. I'll just talk about my chapter on Melbourne. Basically what I was looking at in Melbourne, is it possible to sustain uh, food production for people living in Melbourne without, without the sort of fossil fuel subsidized transport that we now use. You know, we, know, we know that vast amounts of the food that's now used in Melbourne comes from huge distances away using fossil fuels to transport that, whether it's on ships or planes or, or just diesel trucks or trains or whatever. And it seems likely to me that, it, that in a future with only renewable energy, it won't be possible to, to, to really put so much energy, it will make a lot more sense to localise food production. So given that kind of premise, then you look at the situation of how much land is necessary for that. And I estimate like something like, um, I think it's 0.8 of a hectare for, for, the, for the food, for fairly food minimal needs for people in Melbourne. At present, people in Melbourne, for a family of five, in present people in Melbourne are using up to 19 hectares for their food needs. This is largely because of huge amounts of beef, cattle and sheep that, are, that they're eating and so on. Anyway, my, my conclusion basically is that we would need about five times the land we now have in the suburbs of Melbourne, even if we used every football field and railway edge to grow things. Uh, to, to grow enough food for the people in Melbourne. So consequently, I argue at the end of the chapter that we probably, for a sustainable future in the long term, what we're looking at is a much more distributed population 
sort of uh, with, with small towns surrounded by farmland. So I'll finish with that. Great, thanks very much. Um, I apologize because it seems like the, um, the URLs that I thought I'd put in didn't go up, but they are up there now in chat for those people who um, have looked before and didn't find them. They are there now. Um, so we'll start, we've got um, three, three big questions actually. Um, and of course, everyone um, is invited to pop some, some questions into Q&A. As they, as they desire. Um, so the first question was, where there is land scarcity and boom population, how can we get uh, sustainable productivity? And I suppose this one, this question really comes back to cities, which is that question that to some extent you're addressing in your chapter, or perhaps not so much addressing as a raising as a really key issue. Um, do either of you, Fern or Terry, have something to say about land scarcity and boom population and sustainable production? Yeah, um, oh, I don't mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I, okay, I don't, I don't necessarily think there, there, there is, but what we know about population is that the best way to control it is, is to, to increase the security that people have in their old age. So they're not having lots of children to, to, to deal with the insecurity of being old, one. And the second thing is to make sure that women have power and are educated and can actually make choices about, about giving birth to children. And if we have both of those conditions met, we'll see population start to stabilise out. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not that worried about that in the long term, if we can actually change things. Uh, what, I, what I'd say about that is we don't actually have land scarcity on the, on the planet at the moment in terms of the, the population that we've got. What, what we have is a, a massive overuse of land for things that are actually not necessary. That, you know, I, I mean, the classic example would be that we, we could get by with 2.4% of Victoria's total land area if we, were, if we were eating chickens and small livestock grown locally and, you know, as our protein supply and we're just growing our own veg, veg, vegetables and cereals nearby and so on. Whereas at the, at the moment we're using 70% of Victoria's land. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's crazy. Um, so, and, and I mean, I know Australia is a special case, but it's not that special. And, and the fact is that um, there, there are other, par other parts of the world we could possibly relocate people from some of the areas which are massively overpopulated into areas that are less populated. There really isn't a problem of population at such at the moment, though, though it's, 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 it's sensible to, to look at this as a possibility in the future. I'll, I'll just jump on the back of that um, as well in, in terms of thinking about research in cities. I'm really interested in, in um, urban food uh, practices. And I suppose the innovation and community aspects of cities and how we can redesign cities to use them better in terms of food. So it doesn't have to just be sort of a large community garden style, but we can have so many different innovative approaches to food production in cities, um, as well as food sharing and the redistribution of waste from surplus and all these different ways of people bringing people together in a city space to, to access food in more um, just and sustainable ways. Uh, so for example, here in Trondheim in Norway, I'm working with students at the moment to look at productive urban portals so how we can bring people together like on, in common spaces or different spaces across the city to, to come up with different ways of doing things in cities, different ways of doing food. Um, another example of one of my student works is looking at wasted spaces. And so what, how can we re consider spaces in cities, the walls, the underground, the on tops, all in, on different, and here in Norway, we have lots of basements and all these, like, all these different ways that we can bring people together to, um, to, to rethink food production as well. So I think there's so many different ways of doing this and I completely agree. I, I, I don't think we're anywhere near the land scarcity issue. I know land's a very big important topic, but I think it's, it's a lot more to it than, than just that. And there's a lot more complexity that we can add to it. A lot more sides to the story. Yeah, well, I think that um, you both to some extent covered some of the other questions. So um, we've got a series of questions um, that are connected. 
why do people get confused between too many people and too many greedy people? One of the things that I'd like to throw in there is, is that um, degrowth is very much um, about re-enchanting the world and actually uh, trying, people, trying to make people aware that they don't need to um, have their, their kind of needs in terms of status um, or emotional um, needs met within the market, as we've all been sort of normalised to do. Um, looking very much at sort of overconsumption as a kind of cultural um, and social practice. Um, so the other thing is, is, is that I, I, I don't think we, need, we should lose sight of the fact that, yeah, it's security, not just greed, that makes people um, want to surround themselves with um, various goods in the kind of society like capitalism is actually kind of driven by security being provided by money. So that's a kind of contradiction that's um, really within that kind of um, system. Um, and so the same person who asked that question, John is saying, asking, so we don't have a population problem, we've got a wealth distribution problem. Is it, Terry, I, I don't think that you're just saying wealth distribution problem. Is that right? You're going further than that? Yeah, I, um, yes, I, I mean, do we, we don't have a population problem. I, I, I was just looking at it in terms of food actually in what, in what I said before. Um, yes, clearly we have a huge problem with excessive use of resources by the rich, rich elite of the world. The top 20% of the world are using 80% of the world's resources, and 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 like, but but we need we need we need to 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 live to live at a much more sparse lifestyle. But that, for environmental reasons, um, I mean, I I think I'd like to just make a bit of addition to what to what Anita just said. I mean, one of the things is within a capitalist economy, firms can have to compete in order to stay in the market and, and owners of, of capital have to com be in, in competitive firms that are competing to gain market share. That's, an, that's, that's a sort of economic structure which leads to growth. And I mean, so gr greed is only a part of it in the sense that people are insecure in their ownership of their capital. And so they feel like they have to expand it and market more and market more just to hang on to it. And that's a reality of the capitalist economic structure. It's not part of human nature. And in terms of consumers, and we see lots of consumers around us in the rich countries who are obviously overspending and spending a vast amount on things that are maybe not necessary. The, uh, my, my, my analysis of that is that there's, that there's a sort of deal in, in modern society in the rich countries between ordinary people and, and the rich, which is that ord ordinary people will go to work and do what they're told at work and have a really boring day at work and have no control of, over their work processes. And then they go home and they splurge and buy things. And, and this is sort of like consumerism is built into as a compensation for, for people's bad experiences at work. Again, this is something which in a degrowth society, we would, we, we would be able to transcend by giving people meaningful and enjoyable work and the, and work, and the work that they, that they could, you know, so they wouldn't be trying to look for the next consumer good to, to, to make their lives feel, feel, feel fulfilled. So, yeah. Fern, there's, thanks, Terry, that was great. Um, Fern, there's a question then to, um, and I'm not so sure, it would seem to be your bag, but maybe not because you've only been in Norway a little amount of time, but it sort of says that is a, a things different in Scandinavia. Um, no, not, 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 not in terms of what I was just sort of the point I was making. Um, <laughs> no, so what I was... It, I'm saying that we should look at the, the local conditions of wherever we live in, ter in terms of adapting um, innovative solutions that make sense for those places. And so uh, looking at cities here, I mean, if we look at Norwegian cities, we only have sunlight for like 100 days of the year, growing time. So we have to adapt to what makes sense. So, yeah, so I don't think it's anything about, I mean, if anything, Australia has got so much wealth and you've got so much more space, it's a lot less, I've just moved here from Spain, so the density in, in Barcelona is much, much worse than here. I mean, it's incredible, it's the highest density city, I think, in Europe. So, um, 
yeah, I think Australia has got so much, so much resources and access to land and sunshine and all those other things that you could adapt uh, food economies to as well. So, yeah, I don't think it's anything to do specifically with Norway. It's just one one example of many in terms of um, growing food for deer growth opportunities in cities in particular. Now, um, Phoebe asks, are hybrid economies that also utilise market mechanisms controversial in degrowth movements? Is there an assumption that in degrowth that we move towards total non-monetary exchange? Um, and so I'll just have a quick go at that. Um, working sort of as much from a book that uh, I wrote that was published last year, um, written with Vincent Leger as the lead author, Exploring Degrowth. And there we put forward a chapter that's on a kind of degrowth project, which pulls together numbers of different strategies um, that people have some confidence um, in terms of moving forward. And so what everyone agrees on is relocalizing economies, um, but there's uh, ways in which um, people's needs could be met in kind by a kind of public service that might run pretty much, keep running on a waged kind of uh, level. Um, there's uh, also ideas and in certain degrowth case studies, people use uh, alternative forms of currencies I think that what everyone agrees with is, is that somehow or another, we need to make sure that everyone's needs are met, but that actually there's also a maximum, there's a limit on what people can use. And so that's where the matter departs. And there is also a general understanding that if you're working with a profit-making uh, kind of formula, uh, that, you, that this is growth and where what we need to be doing is actually dealing with what I call real values, that's social and environmental values. So the accounting focus is very much on materials and energy, on the impact, is, is this regen, is that this, able to be produced within the regenerative limits of earth? Um, is it expending too much um, energy from people? Is it exploitative in that sense? So in a sense, the, the approach is non-monetary in terms of thinking about what we're doing in life. And there's a general sense that, well, what do we, why do we have money anyway? But because we all live in monetary economies and we're still part of monetary economies in, to a large extent, then one needs to negotiate. Yeah. I, I, I do, yeah, I could have a go at that. I mean, yeah, my, my answer to that question is that I, th I think degrowth is, um, it doesn't have a fixed position on that. Degrowth is a broad movement and and that different different writers in degrowth respond would respond to that question quite differently um, a, a, a book that I really like is called degrowth and movements and it's um an edited collection of different degrowth writings and it's very clear in that book if you look at that that different chapters so some of them envisage a totally non-monetary alternative is the long-term future and others don't uh, and you know I I think that's um well, I, I, I do, I'd have to say that I think that's one of the strengths of degrowth at the moment as a movement that it doesn't actually, um, you know, say, you, you know, you shall think this or whatever. It's like it does, it does allow for different options. And, and in, in cooperating in the present, I don't think it's necessarily uh, necessary to, it's, it's not actually necessary to make, to, to, to decide on that issue in, in many ways. Um, anyway. And again, just jump on the back of that. Um, I think we really need a lot of diverse approaches. And so, you know, to get more and more people involved and to, do, and to bring people in and to think about the, the local conditions in different places, I mean, there's going to be lots of different ways of, I think, achieving a degrowth. And so maybe that we don't, I, I, I suppose I have issues with this one-stop option. There's going to be lots of ways to get there. 
And so rather than saying it's just one solution now that we have to get to, it's like, let's think about all these different paths that people can take in all these different circumstances, all these different backgrounds to try, to try and reach that goal. And I think we, we having a diverse, all these different options is, is just so incredibly essential. So I'm hoping that we captured that some of a tiny, tiny portion of, of that diversity in the book and um, of how people can move towards what could possibly be a non-monetary exchange. Because I know that the movement is very, is very broad as well. So now there's another question. Do any of the, this is from Kerry. Um, do any of the chapters engage with the material and energy throughput of any food case studies empirically? I feel that this is really key to degrowth. Most food and degrowth seems to focus only on the justice, equity, democracy, and anti-utilitarian aspects of degrowth. But I feel that without the reduction in material and energy throughput, then it falls short in amounting to degrowth. Are we just assuming that community supported agriculture, market gardens, or food self provisioning, et cetera, actually use less inputs overall compared with larger enterprises? She says, I hope that makes sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, some of what we've just been talking about probably reassures you that we are, we've actually got our minds a lot more on the material and energy um, accounting than market-based operations. And in our book, as uh, Terry mentioned, in the Czech Republic case, they're quite uh, statistical of thousand, uh, surveys that have been done of thousand, um, thousands of uh, households and how much food they grow and exactly what vegetables they grow and how much they share, all of that kind of thing is actually really, really, really key to degrowth. And we would heartily agree with you that that, that, that focus in the empirical literature, instead of it being monetary kind of totals of what's being produced uh, or exported or whatever um, is much more important and is really, really key to degrowth. Yeah. Um, could I, I'd just like to say something about that. Um, I, I, I think I don't find that in the chapters there's a, a detailed quantitative analysis of, of energy use in kilojoules or or materials used, but, but nevertheless, there are various indications of why uh, the contributors believe that, um, that, that the, the um, initiatives that they're involved in uh, are part of degrowth in, in materials and energy terms. For example, um, relocalization re is a huge theme in all of these, and, and clearly the transport of food over long distances is, is one of the main uses of fossil fuel, you know, one of the main causes of fossil fuels, like it currently, the food system uses 30% of, of, of energy. And, and so, you know, relocalization is clearly a part of, the, of, of what you're talking about. The second thing is that um, in, in terms of that relocalization, various authors in the book talk about um, transport not using fossil fuels, for example, using carts in, um, to, to bring produce from, from the, the urban periphery into a small town. Um, there's, there's an initiative that um, Vincent Legay, one of the contributors who works with Anitra on an, in another book, talks about, which is a bike, a bike transport system for food. Uh, to bring food in from the countryside into the towns. Um, the, the other thing is, of course, that people talk about the use of organic um, methods in, in, in food growing. And, and clearly what, they, what they're, they're also talking about, and they mentioned this, is that you know, they're not using toxic pesticides, um, synthetic fertilizers, and so on. And this is discussed in quite a few of the chapters. So although there's not um, you know, a quantification quantified a detailed quantitative analysis in this particular book. There are certainly pointers in this, in, to this. Um, and and, I, and I, I suppose I'd just say, you know, to, to get this sort of detail that you're talking about, you should be looking at books on, you know, from agroecological agro perspective or a permaculture perspective, which actually deal with this, this question in that, in, that, in that kind of, you know, detailed quantitative calculation. But in a sense, that's exactly what your chapter does. Your chapter. Well, yeah, that's true. My chapter certainly does a detailed quantitative evaluation of 
the food growing in Melbourne and how much space is available and, you know, like, yeah, what will actually work. And basically what I'm saying is that there's no way without a fossil fuel subsidy that you can actually feed Melbourne on the, on the, on the, on the, you know, the, the amount of land that there is already in the city and we need to move out anyway. Yeah. Um, now, it seems that we've lost, we lost something. We've lost, who have we lost? Um, Maybe not. No. Um, okay, then. Great. So, um, Michelle says, how could you possibly suggest that we don't have a population problem? I actually agree with her. And what do you think about local currencies? Um, my position on local currencies is, is that it's a bit... Um, the problem is, is as though, although we refer to them in a generic way like that, they actually operate in quite different ways. So, where you have developed a local currency system, which uses in your own mind, um, and all the minds of the people in the group, um, the, let's call it a point system, um, the points are equal, one point is equal to one dollar, you're essentially just creating a credit system within the ordinary monetary economy. And from my point of view, it actually doesn't mean that you've changed anything much at all, except that you developed um, some kind of trust with other people that you borrow and lend. Um, however, um, and some currency systems, um, such as time banks, for instance, but also there have been currencies um, in the past that have worked more, say, on the basis of saying, let's all talk about any work that we do, whether we're a doctor or a dentist or we're a babysitter. Um, and we, say, give five points for every hour of whatever work it is. Um, so that's kind of moving in a bit of a different direction, but without everything else moving in a different direction, it, from my point of view, local currencies don't necessarily change terribly much at all. In fact, you know, and you'll find that if you actually have a good look at alternative currency literature. So what do you, Fern, think about that? Um... I haven't really gone so much into alternative currencies. I mean, I know that they, the people are using them, say, in Barcelona with the SIC, um, and I think it's been really popular there, and it's it's ongoing. It's been, it's been a long-term project that's been successful um, in terms of the, you know, different ways of exchanging food um, and putting more priority on ecological and labour and all that kind of the other the other values that dear growth is sort of looking at. Um, yeah, no, I don't, no, I, I haven't really used sort of economy so much, I'm sorry, more food practices rather than monetary or non-monetary, I suppose. I think actually the Barcelona um, example really proves my point because it's a really um, radical um, social um, movement that's engaged in all kinds of different forms of production at the same time as using the local currency. Mm. So that's that, that that it's kind of got a different perspective. So the currency in itself is more a little bit like a ration ticket and you know, which is really different from money. Terry. Yeah, I'm not sure that I've got a lot to say about that. I mean, um, I suppose I in, don't envisage a non monetary economy running running with local currencies. On the other hand, I think that local currencies can be can be useful at the present time. Um, in giving people a sense of security in in exchanging labour with each other. I mean, that's basically what they do, you know, in the sense that uh, people exchange labour at the same rate so that, that, that they get a certain amount of local currency dollars for working for an hour, whatever kind of work it is, and they swap that. I mean, the, the, the problem with local currencies, I think, in the, in the context of, you know, big first world cities and so on, is that... Um, people find it hard not to be involved in the market economy more broadly. And in a sense, the local currency is a subs 
subsidiary of that or become becomes implicated in that in various ways you know like so if you're in a professional job and you're and you're working 70 hours a week or 60 or 50 hours a week whatever you're not you're not going to um think that you know it, it's worth your while to be involve yourself in the local currency so there's all sorts of class implications in the way they're taken up within the current context i mean that doesn't mean they're a bad idea but all i'm saying is that you can't you can't look at them in any particular case without analysing how they fit into the local economy more broadly. I don't know, that would be my take on it. So, um, Vicky asks, um, Terry seems to suggest that at least here in Victoria, we should be producing food on far less land, that is, raising smaller animals, <clears throat> such as chickens, where does the farming of dairy and beef cattle come into this, including for export? Yeah. Okay. So definitely, um, in not and not 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 just using smaller animals, but also eating a more vegetarian diet is obviously part part of that as well. Um, cl clearly, you can get more protein out of out of a hectare of, you know, soybeans than you can get out of a hectare of pasture land. Um, and, and but 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 as but yeah definitely beef and dairy cattle are a big problem and the fact that we're i mean exporting them yeah it, that that's an entirely true it's like we're using our land in australia for where for purposes of feeding the middle class in other countries uh on 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 food from from any kind of nutritional point of view that they don't actually need uh, at the same time as our wildlife struggles to survive, you know that we've got a huge rate of extinction because we're using up all this land. So, yep, absolutely. Did you want to say anything, Fern? No, no, I, I agree. I think um, I think we need to adapt more to what's going on locally rather than um, keep going with the same, you know, the same diet. I think we need to rethink that diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, when we have um, international degrowth conferences, typically the, the food um, not just comes from local areas and it's seasonal and um, it's primarily vegetarian, um, but a lot is dumpster dived for. And yeah, so it's like doing with what you have, what you can. Now, um, Elena asks, what are some examples of regenerative farming with co-located housing, given that regenerative farming requires more labour and housing is so expensive? These work against each other in implementation, particularly where land use zoning prohibits multiple occupancy on agricultural land. Um, I know of Twin Oaks in, um, in Virginia, um, in the United States, um, that's an example of that. And there are a variety um, of other examples. Um, I'm just, I know someone who's in, very involved, in fact, um, is probably considered the leader of the, the land sovereignty movement here in, um, or food sovereignty movement in, um, in Victoria. Um, and they run a pig farm and they're degrowthers. And it's a, you know, it's a big joint sort of household. So that would be another example. Um, but they definitely, they, these um, exist. And some of the examples that we have in our book involve those, those kinds of um, cases. Terry or Fern, can you throw in some examples you're aware of or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll go first. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I know a purple pear farm in, in the Hunter Valley. Um, that's that's a um, a biodynamic and organic farm run on permaculture principles, um, and they've done a CSA system with box boxes, and like basically they don't. Um, in terms of zoning, I think they're probably zoned as not, not as multiple occupancy. But what they've done is constructed a number of um, dwellings on, on their block where where they they house people who've come for training so so that so in a sense they have they have participate they have participants who are who are both helping them with their agricultural work and also training so there's some ways of getting around this 
Uh, and that's certainly an example of a regenerative agriculture that's, that's working by getting people onto the land in another way other than through multiple occupancy as such. But I, I'd also say that there are quite a lot of multiple occupancy options in the Australian context. I'm not sure about in other countries. I mean, the main thing in, in, in countries like Britain is that land is phenomenally expensive and, and it's monopolised by, by a small elite. So it's like, it's very hard for regenerative agriculture um, enthusiasts and people who want to just to start a small cooperative to, to run a small CSA that, that, that serves the local people to actually buy land to do this. And in a lot of cases, what people do is they borrow land or in, in Norway, in, for example, in, in um, an example I'm looking at in another book, it's like um, they rent land from, from a local farmer. So that's an option, yeah. <clears throat> so these are people who are living in town. So in terms of housing, they're living in town and they're renting land on the periphery uh, that's owned by a farmer in order to do a com community supported agriculture system. And I suppose just to say it's about relationships there um, and developing those relationships with people and, and sort of extending them from the city out to the country. But also a lot of people I met who were working on uh, CSAs in Barcelona would be people who originally were in the city who've moved out to the country and then continue that relationship to work back and, and develop those um, direct ethical and degrowth food systems that way. Yeah. Yeah. So Adam's asking, do any of the panelists have thoughts on how ideas of degrowth might be used to engage with mainstream production systems and corporations, for example, the duopoly of Coles and Woolies in Australia? And um, no, that I that that's really got me stumped. Um, I've uh, uh, I've been approached by someone who works in business organisation about um, giving a talk um, to a conference uh, where there's a whole big workshop and it's mainly with business people. But the person who's running it actually says that the, the days of monopolies um, uh, and therefore coals and woolies as such are really gone. And that um, I, I'm not exactly sure what the theories are behind um, what he talks about. But um, really, degrowth is working in a completely different direction um, to uh, growth corporations. They're, not, they're there to make money. They're not there to meet people's needs. And degrowth is about meeting people's needs. And uh, so we're looking at uh, local production and small enterprises and people uh, selling fresh produce at markets, yeah, very short supply chains, not these massive supply chains that, you know, if you go into Coles and Woolies, you probably got every country in the world represented in terms of where their food has come from. So really quite different. But Fern or Terry, do you have anything to say about that? Just really, really quickly, just a quick comment is... Um... It's, I see degrowth as, well, food for degrowth is opening up spaces outside of these, this dominance of, the, of, you know, woolies and coals, you know, so it's, um, it's more, I mean, I always go back to sort of Gibson Graham's work, you know, sort of look, recognizing the, how, how these, there's that sort of false belief that there's only one option. You know, and it's like what we're trying to do is break open that space and say there's there are so many other ways of um, addressing food. It might not be complete. It might be a transitionary step. It's incredibly diverse, but it's happening. It's abundant. It's going on. And, and, this, and these alternatives are looking at so many different approaches and values and you know, places and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's not, it, rather than sort of just kind of open up that alternative space to look at what else exists. And I think... That's that's where our focus is, I think, also. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'd like to say something about that. Is that is that um, that that I, I think that that that's exactly right. What, what Fern and Nietzsche have been saying about this, we're trying to open up spaces outside of that sort of commercial duopoly, which is you know driving the wages of people involved in farming down to rock bottom, uh, and exploiting the land completely and causing causing massive environmental problems um, and 
I don't know. I, I suppose one of the things I really like about this book is that it talks about surprising amounts of food being go, grown and produced outside of these formal systems, particularly when we're looking at the at the chapters which look at Eastern Europe. You know, like the chapter on um, the what they call the dashes in Estonia, which is a like um, co allotment cooperatives that just out placed outside of the ta large towns and small cities and so on. Where, where, where members who are like urban workers, whatever, go go to grow vegetables. Now, and the same sort of thing, thing being described in Hungary in another chapter and and the Czech Republic in another chapter. And, and like, what what's so amazing about these is that they're growing like the, the, something like 40% of their food needs from these allotments. Now that's a huge dent in the duopoly of Coles and Woolworths and what the, the, in, in the Australian context, people are buying, you know, 90% or 95% of their food from commercial outlets. If we were just sort of to, to, to embrace a lot more food self-provisioning through and community gardens and backyard gardening and roadside gardening as the permaculture movement has been emphasizing for so long, then it, it's surprising how much of a dent you could make in this system. And I'd like to see that as like, it's the first stage and then we just completely de destroy this goals and wars and do without them completely. We don't need them, you know, but we need, but, but the first step is to, to move on this, on the thing, on the easy pickings, the low hanging fruit. And that's what this book describes in some detail. Now, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, but Diane has said 2020 taught us that hitting the brakes on status quo, let alone a low consumption lifestyle scaled up, does indeed hack the economy and livelihoods as we know them. So what will uh, these uh, things look like in a truly sustainable world? How's, and she goes into house prices skyrocketing um, and you know, limited employment and that kind of thing. And one thing that I'd say to Diane is, is, is that the Feminism um, and Degrowth Alliance, you know, say your, your austerity is not our degrowth, okay? So we're not talking about people who are needy going without. Um, what we're talking about is everyone's basic needs being met but people not having more than that. So the savings that we're may, we make is not the way that capitalism makes savings, which is by making the poor people poorer, but it's about taking, redistributing money from rich people so that poor people's needs are met. So it's really quite different. It is not, it is not austerity. It's not hitting the brakes on the way that, um, that people are producing and taking things from them. And I suppose that's where a lot of the monetary economy and the suspicion of the monetary economy and the way it actually functions, that those kind of tendencies occur within the monetary economy. Um, and that's why degrowth is actually very suspicious of that. And what we're experimenting with is trying to create mini worlds where that kind of thing doesn't happen and everyone's needs are met and they have shelter and housing. So if you looked at the Housing for Degrowth book that we put out, another collection in this series, a couple of years ago, there you've got a whole series of ideas about how to satisfy your housing needs in a degrowth way, which doesn't involve pricing. And typically this is withdrawing housing market models from the market system. A last few words each. Read the book. <laughs> no, I really recommend there's so much going on in that book and um, lots of great examples. So yeah. Yeah, that'd be my last comment too. It's a great book, lots of wonderful examples, lots of detail, totally fascinating stories. You won't, you won't believe, etc. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, Claire Denby. Thank you to um, Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute and, of course, to the National Sustainable Living Festival um, for hosting us um, to launch our book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Bye-bye. <laughs>